Could you please raise your hand if you've used persistent term in your work before? Okay, cool, we got some people. Um, I'm also curious, how, raise your hand if you've used the Rodox try data structure before. All right, we got one at least. That's very nice, maybe algorithms. So let's, um, the title of this talk is bot IP, classifying bot IPs. It's really more about the tools that you get with Elixir and Erlang to solve a problem like this. So let's begin. I'm the founder of uh, Paraxial.io, my name's Michael. It's uh, a bot detection tool, so similar to reCAPTCHA or Cloudflare bot defense. And what's cool about the company is not only is the entire backend and everything written in Elixir, but also all of Paraxial.io's customers are using Elixir in Phoenix as well. So if you're curious about what the product is and how it works, just come up to me during the conference or feel free to send me an email. If you're watching this remotely at home as well, please feel free to contact me. I'm interested in learning about what you thought of the talk. So the story for today, we begin with Kat. She's a software engineer at blackcatconcerttickets.com, which is a web application written in Elixir and Phoenix. And she runs into a problem where bots are purchasing concert tickets before real people can. So a uh, concert goes on sale, all of the tickets get purchased, and then the scalpers are reselling those tickets for a profit, which is not what you want to be happening. So Kat investigates this and determines that all of the bots are coming from the IP address of a major cloud provider's rented servers. So here's the situation that we're in right now. The concert tickets go on sale, the bots buy all the concert tickets, and the real people can't, and this is bad. So Kat's solution is to write a plug that takes about one million IP prefixes from this cloud provider, and then when the request comes in, match against that and determine, is this a bot or a real user? So that's, I want you to think of that as like a textbook exercise. Think about how you would approach that if you were given that task and what tools you would use in Elixir and Erlang underneath. So real world bot detection is also much more complicated than this. This is a simplified example just for our discussion today. So the two problems that I wanna focus on, the first is you quickly have to determine if an IP address matches those one million IP prefixes. So that's gonna be the data structure that you're choosing here. The second problem is, you know, let's say that's about 28 megabytes to store in memory, and then you have all of these Elixir processes that need to access that. How do you do that in an efficient way? So problem number one, the cloud provider where the bots are you know, renting their servers to do the attacks, publish is the IP address range in sitter notation. So in IPv4, it looks like 35140 slash 22, and then IPv6, that's the 2600. That represents a range of IP addresses. Cat has one million of these prefixes. The request comes into the Phoenix app. She wants to compare all one million of those against the incoming IP and determine if it matches. And because this is you know, in your pipeline in Phoenix, a slow implementation is gonna hurt every single request, so performance is very critical. The first bad idea is to try to expand all of the IP addresses corresponding to the prefix. So this is a slash 22, it's about 1,000. Computers can fit 1,000. And IPv6, it's some insanely large number. You have no hope of, of putting that in memory. So think about information encoding really quick. If you have to determine if a number is between one in a million in Elixir, you don't create a list in Elixir of every integer, one, two, three, four, up to a million. It's a horrible waste of memory. You just do a range, which you really only need two integers, the one in a million, and you just do your comparison. So all the information is there in your IP address. In this IPv4 prefix, the slash 22, all of the information is encoded in that string we just need a way to represent this in Elixir for a fast comparison of those 1,000 possibilities. And good news, there's actually this really excellent library. I've been trying to contact the author to thank them, and I haven't been able to, so if you know this person, send them my regards. It actually will parse a string for a IP prefix, and then you get this nice struct where the bits are a binary in Elixir, and then max length, think of it as a represented in bits, so it's just a bit length of 32. 
IPv6, the bit length is 128, but it's the exact same idea. So now you have a list of all of these prefixes put into this, these nice data structures where you can match quickly. So imagine putting them in an Elixir list and then your con remote IP comes in so you compare and compare and compare. This is still O of N performance because you know, a list in Elixir is a, is a linked list underneath, so you have to iterate through the entire thing to determine membership. But you may be thinking, okay, well, yeah, this is an unsorted list, but what if you could somehow sort these prefixes, put them in a tuple, maybe start in the middle and do a type of binary search? If you're thinking that way, that's very good because you're, you're getting at the solution here. So this is the Radix tri data structure. Um, I gave a simple example here to kind of introduce it to you. So imagine you have to store some integers between zero and eight. In this case, eight is the one we want to check if it's in this data structure. So eight in binary, think of it as one, zero, zero. The leftmost bit is one. And then if you, let's say you had to check if this was represented a list, you'd have to iterate through the entire list. That's where you get that O of N performance problem. But with the Radix try, you start at the leftmost bit, bit zero, and then it's a zero or a one. And in this case, it's a one, so you can immediately determine if it is in the data structure. And this is much more performant. And in Elixir, same author as uh, PFX, this is a really fantastic library. It actually gives you IPv4 and IPv6 support. So you see I have 128.000, that's a slash eight. If that's represented in bit notation, the leftmost bit is a one. So it's really fast to determine if that's in this data structure here, you literally just check bit zero, okay, go to the right, it's in there as a leaf, you've got your answer. No need to iterate. Because think of the bit seven node, imagine if there were like a million subnodes in that. With a list, that's where your performance hit is gonna happen. So this is what it looks like if you do IP treat iptry.new, it takes the list of the prefixes and you can see 32 here is the key. That is the length and it's just you know, normal struct in Elixir. So you might be curious like, okay, what's the actual performance of this? I implemented try lookup and list lookup. For the people in the back, it's about 5,000 times slower on uh, 10,000 prefixes. So about two millisecond increase. For 100,000 prefixes, we're up to 33 millisecond, and then for 1 million prefixes, which is you know, the problem we're dealing with here, um, you, you will actually notice it now, just on the data structure lookup. Uh, meanwhile, the, the Radix try implementation, is actually, you can still measure it in microseconds, which is really fantastic. So, seems like problem solved, right? Like we've got this Radix try, this great data structure. The problem in Elixir, though, is that we have all of these processes that need to access this data structure at the same time. So how do you solve that part? And maybe your first idea is to use a gen server, which is a terrible idea, because the, of the way that the process mailbox will deal with the incoming requests. So you have IP0, you want to determine if, okay, does that match on IP try? Seems simple enough. The problem is you just implement, you just cause this bottleneck in your whole application where you're trying to fit all of these requests through one gen server. So even though it may be only a tiny delay because the Radix try is very efficient, now every bit of time increments and increments and increments and it's just horrible. So you don't want to do this. And that pattern of the gen server bottleneck is so common in the Elixir getting started guide for ETS, it mentions that. So Naturally, you might, be, might say, oh, okay, well, I'm not gonna use gen server here, let's use ETS. Also, not a good idea, though, um, for this problem. The reason you don't wanna do that is that ETS does not have like a Rodex try type inside, so you can't do like an ETS lookup on it. When you have a process ID and you wanna check does this IP address match that try, you have to get the entire IP try out of ETS into the calling process, and in this case, that's a 28 megabyte memory copy. So you have a few users on the app, you're gonna just quickly blow up your memory usage. Okay, so it is all hope lost. We have this big 28 megabyte data structure, the Rodix try. 
We have many processes that need to access it very quickly. And the IP try doesn't really change. So on startup, you can parse all of those one million prefixes, you build up the IP try, and we don't really need updates. So that's the current situation we're in. If you just type that into Google, you'll probably find the fast global library from Discord. It has about 1,000 stars on GitHub. And it uses this property of um, Erlang where if you have a constant term and then it gets compiled at runtime, you can access that in a really efficient way. So you've kind of created this shared global heap. That's why it's um, called fast global, I believe. But that optimization has a really interesting history. This is just what I was able to dig up. So it was an Erlang mailing list post from 2009 about this technique, the constant pool. It was in uh, Muchi Web, I think popularized it. Uh, the copyright on, on that GitHub is about 2010. Fast Global came out, the first commit was 2017 when I looked at it. And then the module called Persistent Term was introduced in OTP 21.2 on December 12th, 2018. Um, the reason I just bring up the older, the constant pool optimization, it's just considered an a, kind of an outdated version of persistent term now, because persistent term is in OTP, it's just the more efficient way to do this, it's implemented in a better way. So, it also comes with a warning label, which I think is really cool. Um, it's an advanced feature and is not a general replacement for ETS tables. It's been highly optimized for reading terms at the expense of writing and updating terms. So you may, might come across this documentation and think, what situation would I really need this thing? And the problem that we're dealing with is, is really a perfect example. So I, this is the ETS implementation. Um, I just did 20 processes, which is really light for an Elixir app. And you can see the memory spike was up to you know, 3,000 megabytes, any higher, and the whole thing will just crash. Compare that to persistent term, you can see that the memory goes up, that's just building the IP try. I did it pretty inefficient, you could get much better performance. But the real important part is this plateau here, all of the processes are accessing it, but there's no memory variance at all, it just stays flat, which is exactly what you want. So, now cat implements the one million IP prefixes, puts that in the IP try using persistent term, just does a plug in Phoenix, now all of the bots are getting blocked and people can buy their concert tickets in peace. So the conclusions here, use the correct data structure for the problem that you're dealing with. Gen server can be a bottleneck, so watch out for that. ETS will copy non-binary format data to the calling process, meaning a literal, like, like a binary in Elixir. Um, in this case, you know, the Rodox try is like a map, so gets copied. And then if your data is not frequently updated or deleted, use persistent term. I do also want to mention this Erlang mailing list post about using the ordered set in ETS. The reason I, I point this out is because the, implement, the implementation here isn't really good for if you had to update um, or delete things when it was running in production. If you can get this ordered set implement, you would get that benefit. Um, I played around with it a bit. I don't really have any code that's close to production ready, but I figured this crowd, if, if you know anyone working in this area, please, um, I'll put my email up at the end, but I'm, I'm very interested in this topic. Um, so yeah, that's the conclusion of the talk. That's my email, I'll leave it up. This talk is based on a blog post up on the Paraxial IO blog, so you can read through. I posted some Phoenix code if you wanna run it yourself. Um, I learned better that way, so figured it might be useful. Thank you guys, thank you all. Oh, hello. Thank you, Michael. So we'll be taking questions. Um, if, if you have any, I will bring the mic to you. Sorry. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about persistence terms that you're not supposed to update because it has all these problems that it will carry. You use, do you use something like this in production? And if so, how do you handle updates? In, in this case, IP addresses would eventually change. Maybe you get a new list. Do you deal with it somehow? That is a really good question. Um, the summary is this is a very simplified example. So it's like intentionally, yeah. Like if you do update a persistent term, I did play around with it. What happens is it, it triggers a global garbage collection, which degrades the performance of the system overall. You know, maybe that's okay for you, but the docs 
warn against it a lot. But if you're in a situation where you do that update is a requirement, I would I would dig into that ETS ordered set mailing list post. Um, I think it's a good area for future work. But yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, like I, I have seen places where you know this global garbage collection is fine when the server is totally not loaded and you have a hundred processes alive, but you would destroy the thing if you have a million processes alive. So I didn't know if you have like some like delay operation that would wait for the server to be less loaded or things like that. Yeah, that's definitely possible. I personally haven't. If I've ever used persistent term myself, it's just been in a situation where updates aren't needed, basically. OK. Any other questions? Um, so around Radix tries, do you know if that library is implemented purely in Elixir? And did you dig it all into a more generalized, like not just IP tries? I do believe it's in Elixir, yes. When you say more generalized from like, I, like using the Radix try for other things, I, I haven't looked into it. Um, it's really cool. Go on the Wikipedia page for Radix tries. It gives this example of string matching, where imagine you have like similar strings in a dictionary. You need to like do lookups really quick. It, there's this da great diagram of these like similar words. So that's another area I've seen it. But the, the data structure itself is really, is really interesting. Thank you, Michael. Any additional questions? I was curious, are, are there other um, techniques besides, for, like security techniques besides just matching on IP addresses that you're, you're familiar with? There's many of them, yes. <laughs> are, you, are you able to talk about any of those other as well? Oh, yeah. So bot detection is a very big field. I, I just give the IP address example because it's kind of simple and it's good to demonstrate. Like modern bot detection, it's based on like, okay, so there's like CAPTCHAs, which are horrible. Like no one likes them. Um, what's interesting, like it's a lot of fingerprinting. So like your HTTP stack or like the TLS client you're using to connect to a website, you can actually look that. Although that can be spoofed as well. There's a really cool Akamai post about how bots like will intentionally spoof their TLS stack to like get past bot detection. Um, there's other areas too, like browser fingerprinting is really common. It, it's kind of this general fight between like you know bot detection vendors and the people writing the bots. Um, what is what I think is also really interesting though is a lot. There's kind of like tiers for bot detection. So at the very top, you could think of bots doing advertising fraud on botnets, for example, those really want to blend in, like they don't want to get caught. So it's, they're very tricky, but you, you can detect them in certain ways, there's tells. And then kind of lower down the tier, you have someone literally with like a Python script and AWS IPs, and they'll just run it against the whole internet, but it's profitable. So that's why people do it, because they will find sites that they can um, you know, like crack passwords for or do credit card fraud on. Um, yeah, come up to me after, after the, it, it's a very broad topic. <laughs>